think if you're a young kid growing up in America, and you're comparing these two things side by side. Of course, you don't talk to your parents about it. Because they'll, if these kids are right, freak out. So what do you do? You just keep it to yourself and wait for the time when you're old enough to start deciding what your own lifestyle is going to be. You keep it to yourself. You let it just live with these doubts. If you're crazy, you email Jeff Lang and Lawrence Camden. I received two emails today, by the way, and asked him to help you with your problems. And I'll tell you the truth, I don't feel up to the challenge. This takes community effort. It's only so many minutes in a day. There's so much, so much reading I could do. And I, I wasn't bored in the Middle Eastern culture. I don't even understand it. I understand the Western culture. That's all I know. That's where I grew up. And I'll tell you the truth. Things that are obvious from a Middle Eastern point of view or from a Far Eastern point of view are not obvious from a Western point of view. I say to my brothers and sisters, why do you think that's essential to Islam? They give me this argument, I go, that just doesn't make sense. Why? Because I'm thinking from a different cultural experience. <laughs> but in any case, these are some of the things our young people are grappling with. Um, you see, psychologists these days talk very frequently about identity formation. It's a critical phase we all go through, identity formation. As we're going through our life, we're choosing what we're going to put in our identity basket, what we're going to identify ourselves with. Oh yeah, I'd like to be identified with my mom's Middle Eastern cooking. Okay, yeah, my friend did and so forth. Yeah. I like to be identified as somebody of this background. I like to be identified in this way or that way. I like to be identified as a smart student. I like to be identified as a woman and so forth and so on. You know, we constantly are making those choices throughout our life, but especially it reaches its most <coughs> chaotic and difficult period with adolescence. And what happens is as kids reach that stage, you know, it's a very tumultuous part of their life where they're very quickly making major identity choices, what they identify with or not. For kids of immigrant background, that identity crisis is usually much greater, much more intense. For kids of Muslim immigrant background, it could be even much, much more intense. But here's what happens. Basically, the idea is this. To come from two cultures simultaneously, you try to pick, the psychologists have shown this, you try to pick things that fit well in both cultures, of course, easily in both cultures. And then the things that are harder to fit in, you have a more difficult time dealing with. And things that are on the extremes, from one culture's point of view or the other, a lot of times kids tend to ignore or keep out. Are you following me? So if kids go to their messages and they find them to be extreme or nonsensical or irrational, from the other point of view, their other point of view, <laughs> juggling two identities at once, two basic baskets at once, they tend to stay away from them. And so in Lawrence, Kansas, at the beginning of every semester, we have this phenomenon. Converts enter the religion, a lot of them burn out after six, eight, nine months, two years, whatever. I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying a lot of them. We've had 34 converts in the last five years. Right now, two of them still go to a month. But that doesn't mean they all left the religion. Some have moved away, but still, many of them still live in Lawrence and they have nothing to do with the community. But it takes them a while. Our young people, they come to the mosque. They're on the university campus for the first time. They've never been to the mosque. They have Muslim parents. They're one Muslim parent. They go down and give it a try on the first day of classes. They come to the first Friday prayer. They attend it. We never see them again. Visceral counter-reaction. Visceral rejection. It's too painful. And a lot of our young people, other issues, theology, the purpose of life. They're growing up in the United States of America or Canada. They sit, drink coffee with their friends, and they're of a different religion, so the issue of religion and theology often comes up. It's a big, yeah, it's a big talking point for kids in America, especially high school and college age. And somebody asked them, uh, what is your 
religion see as the purpose of life? I don't know, God created us to worship him. Why does your God need to worship? Huh. Well, he actually created us because Adam sin, so he punished everybody for Adam. Why does he put us here to suffer? Why didn't he just pop us into heaven? Why didn't he just make us angels? He wants us to surrender to his will. These are the kinds of questions they face. They are foundational in the Western cultural experience. These are the questions that felt to shade in secular Western culture. So they're going to encounter them. So they go back to the mosque for answers. Ones that will work when they're discussing with their friends, if they go back to the mosque at all. A lot of them just give up. But those are the type of questions I get time and time again. So I always include the first chapter of my books is usually about those theological questions. Many of them are suspicious of the Islamic societies. I'll give you an example, the Hadith literature. A young person goes to the mosque, Friday prayer, hears a Hadith, shakes the foundations of his faith, and he starts looking into the matter. Goes to the library. He's at a university. Goes to the university of the library. Starts researching this. And what does he find? Oh, tons and tons of research in English has been done on the, this great science. But almost all of it. Okay. We kindly request you to pause for a moment while we change the audio tape. <laughs> 